second here. Just let me get everything up and running. Comment window up. All right. And I see Mr. Dave Clayton in the house and Mr. Victoria in the house. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. And let's go ahead and switch over so we can kick things off officially. Welcome everyone to InDesign Tuesday. Uh, my name is Terry White, worldwide designer and photography evangelist for Adobe. Now, by the way, uh, before I really dive into it, there were some issues on Facebook streaming, so hopefully this will play out okay. If not, I am um, streaming it on YouTube and Twitter, and I will start a recording right now just in case I need to repost it to Facebook. So let me do that right now. All right, and let's kick it off. So welcome everyone. My name is Terry White, Worldwide Design and Photography Evangelist for Adobe. It's my pleasure to be streaming to you live here on InDesign Tuesday. We're gonna talk about how to be better organized in InDesign. We're gonna talk both from a UI perspective, just some things you can do to streamline the interface to make it better for you, and also um, some uh, tips and techniques for working with your documents. And I see Adobe Jason in the house. What's going on, Jason? Uh, Jason was just streaming earlier on audio and video and doing something, I think, cartoon related inside of a video. So comic book, that's what it was, comic book related. So welcome, Jason. And if you guys follow Jason, you can go check out his video that he did earlier, I believe, on the Premiere channel. But he'll correct us in the chat if I'm wrong. All right, let me get one more chat window open here. And cool, cool, cool. All right, Colleen, uh, Rochelle, and Cornelian, welcome as well, and glad to hear or glad to have NG Photography here as well. So, with that said, let's jump in and and I'm sorry, let's see, is that Elmutra Elmutia from the Sudan? If I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, I'm sorry. I, I butcher names on a regular basis, so don't take it personally. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and dive over to the computer. And let's jump in and talk about the interface uh, changes and things you should be aware of as an InDesign user. Now, first and foremost, I went old school on my interface just to remind me to show you guys how to change it. So if you look at the light interface, this is how InDesign used to look back in the day. This is how all the Adobe apps used to look back in the day, this very light interface. And I find it so distracting now. Like I can't stand having the light interface anymore. Uh, but I turned it back on just as a painful reminder of how life used to be, but also to let you know you have an option. You don't have to have a dark interface. You don't have to have a gray interface. You don't have to have a light gray interface. You can have any shade of gray between the three or four choices that are available. So let me show you where that is. Uh, we're gonna go to preference. We're gonna go to, oops, sorry, I missed it. Preferences, interface. And yep, four choices. So you can go completely light. I think it defaults to this the second one, which is kind of a dark gray. And then you can even go totally black if you want to. Um, you will find professionals prefer these darker interface choices um, because it lets your eye concentrate more on your work, more on the document as opposed to the interface. So if the document or if the interface is dark, then everything else, meaning the work you're working on, is lighter and easier for your eye to catch because your eye is naturally going to the lightest thing on the page or in the photo or on the document. So that's why now there's a choice between these. Uh, but if you want to go back to InDesign 1.0, it was like, no, nope, it was this one. It was the bright one. You can go back to that. And if you want to go completely dark, you can go completely dark. I kind of like the default. All right, so that's one. I'm just letting you know that you can change your default UI for a cleaner interface. Now, speaking of cleaner interfaces, and this is the very next thing and the biggest thing that I'm gonna talk about today, and that is workspaces. Now, InDesign has had workspaces pretty much from day one, and the workspaces have been there for you to remove panels and things you're not using so that you can concentrate on things that you are using. So for example, if I were to switch to typography, which is one that I work on from time to time, then what that will do is it will get rid of all the panels that I don't need and it will highlight all the ones that I do need to work with typography. So it shows me the story panel, which I normally wouldn't use. 
shows me the hyperlinks panel, the paragraph panel, paragraph styles, character, character styles, text wrap, all the things that would be typography related. If I were to switch it to, for example, interactive in PDF, then it's going to show me those options. So I get the button and forms, I get media, I get Swift preview. Do we still do Swifts? I doubt it. But anyway, uh, the one that I have adopted and kind of made my own out of is digital publishing. So I like the digital publishing one because it shows me all the things I would put into an interactive document, whether it's for an ebook or publish online. So it could be animations, timing, media, object states, buttons, hyperlinks, liquid layout, and for whatever reason, the Adobe Color one that I stuck in there. Or no, that was actually part of the interface. Um, so those are the ones I would use for digital publishing. Now, by default, in the older version of InDesign, you would be on Essentials Classic. So you would have this control strip at the top, you would have these panels in here. Let me reset it just to make sure I'm on the on the original. Okay, this is the original. So this is all the stuff that would clutter in design. You'd have this contextual co co control panel, which is kind of cool because it would relate to whatever you have selected. So if you click into text, it switches to text, but it, you know, depending on the size of your display, it doesn't necessarily show you everything. And if you were to switch to an object, then it's showing you object things, but not necessarily object things that relate to what you would want. And it was just this very confusing, but useful control panel at the very top. Now you'll notice that there is essentials, not classic. <laughs> I mean, that this is the new one. We usually put the word classic on things that are older. So if we go to the new essentials workspace, what you will see is a, hang on, let me reset it. Sorry, I messed it up. Let me reset it. There you go. You'll see a streamlined, no control panel at the top, and you'll see the concentration on the new properties panel. So the properties panel replaces the control panel at the top for most people and offers more options than the control panel at the top ever did. So I, I'm, it take, it's taking me a minute to get used to it, but I'm really liking it because it's giving me so many more choices in a more streamlined view. Um, and again, you can always go back to having the, you can have both. You can go to Essentials Classic to get back the control panel and you can have the properties panel up. But then again, we're talking about how to be better organized. So you probably won't want to, won't want to use both. All right. Um, with that said, I see Anne-Marie Anne Concepcion in the house as well. Welcome. And let's see who we got over here. Rudy. Uh, Nadia, David, welcome as well. So let's keep going. All right, so just being able to not only choose the Adobe uh, workspaces, but of course, being able to make your own. So let's say you wanna start with Essentials, but for whatever reason, you want your old CC Libraries panel to be more prevalent and maybe you want to stick that to the side. So just as an example, I like to have that. So when it's open, it's full. Here, let's collapse the icon there. There we go, to an icon view. So when it's open, I see it all. When it's not open, I don't see any of it. Uh, so if I now do that, I have essentially altered essentials. I basically made a change to the essentials panel. Um, so with that said, I could go in and I could now say new workspace and I could call it Terry Essentials. So these are the panels in the order that I want them in for my own use to be better organized. All right, so now I've got my own Terry Essentials uh, work or workspace that's based on the Essentials workspace, but with my own, own uh, modifications to it. And you can keep modifying it, but if you modify it and you don't save it, then you can always reset it back to the last save that you did. All right, next up. Um, Let's talk about layers. Let's go to the layers panel. And I don't know if the layers panel is even in this workspace. So that would be one thing I'd add right off the bat. Let's go find it. There's the layers panel and there it is. All right, so I'm gonna pull up the layers panel and you'll notice in this document, and I'm just gonna talk about this for a minute. Um, you'll notice that, I can't scroll, hang on. You'll notice that, there we go. 
um, that this particular document has layers based on the type of content that's going to be in the document. So there's a background layer at the very bottom, things that I would want behind everything else. There's a graphics layer. I would, you know, by the name, I would assume that's going to be all the graphics are going to be on that layer. There's a text layer, and then there's a title layer, and the title layer is turned off because it's probably not being used right now. You could even have a notes layer, so you can leave notes for other people or yourself if you're working on this document. So one of the ways to be organized is to definitely work in layers and to remember that layers in InDesign are unlike layers in Photoshop, meaning that typically in Photoshop, you're putting individual images or pieces of an image on a layer. In InDesign, layers are document-wide, so they aren't for a specific page, they aren't for a specific uh, single item, they are organized in a way where um, no matter what page I'm on, I could put something on the text layer. But with that in mind, if you twirl the layer down, you'll notice that every single text frame is on is its own layer in the group called text. So if you wanted to turn on and off specific things, lock specific things, um, that are text related in the text layer, you can do that. So if I wanted to lock that layer, I don't even know which layer that is, but if I wanted to lock it, I could. So now just that one item in the text layer can't be moved, or I could lock the entire text layer. So everything on that layer can't be moved, can't be modified, can't be touched. So um, just keep in mind how InDesign layers work, and more importantly, that you can... Um, you should you should create layers for the types of content you're going to create and that they apply across all pages. And I see David Blattner's in the house. Hey, hey, what's going on, David? All right. So with that said, um, what's next? Layers. Ah, ah, my my favorite organization tip of the day. Besides workspaces, my favorite 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 thing to work on are CC libraries. The reason I like CC libraries is because before CC libraries, the applications had their own library. So, for example, there wasn't it. There still is an InDesign library. And uh, let's see what else had a library. Uh, Muse back in the day had a library. Um, I can't think of any more. But anyway, the individual applications had a library, and that was great for organizing content for that application. So I would put a graphic in, the, in an InDesign library and then the next you know, two weeks from now when I need that graphic, I can open up that library and pull it in. But that only worked in InDesign. If I needed that graphic in Illustrator, sorry, you gotta go find it and do it a different way or copy and paste it. But these libraries work across all your Creative Cloud applications that support libraries, which is just about all of them. So when you create something, when you create a library and put something in it, your item is available if it's compatible with all the other applications. So what's new with libraries is that libraries were typically organized by the type of content. So for example, there's paragraph styles because I'm in InDesign. InDesign can have paragraph styles. Uh, there's graphics. There's templates. So these are InDesign templates I have used in the past. There are videos. There's a video I placed at some point. And there are models, 3D models. And notice that these are grayed out because these are for Adobe Dimension. Because this library isn't just for InDesign. So it can contain things that InDesign doesn't necessarily work with, like models. But as far as organization, that was about it. You couldn't do much. You couldn't do your own organization. So for example, in graphics, this is my Adobe stock library. I have hundreds of graphics in here. And this can be very daunting trying to find the, the graphic you bought, you know, six months ago, because if you keep it in the same library, you're going to be scrolling, scrolling, scrolling forever. So what just got recently added kind of stealthily and at the beginning of the year is the ability to have, um, uh, groups for your library items. So for example, view by type, you now have the choice to view by group. And of course, if you haven't created a group yet, now you get the chance to create a group. You can even auto generate groups, which is kind of not really a good, I'll, I'll admit, not a great option because really all that's going to do is put all the images together, all the brushes together. <laughs> so it's, it's almost like by type. So you're better off creating groups for the type of content that you want to organize. So for example, if I wanted to create a group of 
um, animals. I'll create that group and then I can scroll through and I can find my animals and drag them in. And once they're dragged into a group, they're dragged into a group. So I know I had a bunch of animals down here earlier, some wildlife stuff that I was working on. Uh, there's something, but let's go down to, there we go. So I could take, for, uh, I can take, for example, all of these, except that one, and I could right click instead of dragging, I could right click and I can say add to the group animals. So that way you don't have to scroll your mile long list of library items to move the, move things around. And if I go all the way back up to the top where things are, where groups are, I will see my four or five animals, yep, four animals in that group and I can twirl that down and collapse it. So then I could say, well, maybe I want a group for people. So I'll just right click on this one add the group. Oh, I don't have a people group yet. Let's go ahead and create it and let's uh, name it while we have it selected people. All right. So then I can go and find people and add to the group. And so if you have a, a messy library like I do, it might take you a minute to clean it all up. But once you get it organized, oh my God, it will be so much better to work with and find things because you've organized them into groups. So, for example, these are all people. Let's add them to the people group. And um, just make a, make a project out of it. Make a day out of it. Just go in and, and organize your library. And then that way you will have uh, a better experience when it comes to looking for things in your library. Because now I have people. I have animals. And I would keep going and vectors and buildings and landscapes and travel and all the other groups that I would want. Um, social media, whatever it is I have uh, content for. So that's another way to be organized just in general. That's not an InDesign specific thing, but it will help you along the way. Now, you don't have to keep everything in one library either. I have this big library called Adobe Stock, but I also have libraries for lots of other things. So I have lots of shared libraries. I have lots of libraries that are based on either projects or clients. And uh, those libraries I could jump to to get to those specific things. So, for example, even for my live streams, I have a library for each year. So, Adobe Live 2019. So, these are the things I've worked on so far in my live streams that I can now keep track of. And I started the group thing here for people, vectors, and these are so far, so far ungrouped, which I need to just move those into groups. All right. Um, it's a shame that this wasn't done before now. Well, Cheryl, everything can't be invented all at the same time or the world would explode. So just can't have it. Sorry. Uh, but yes, I agree. And, and you'll, we'll invent something else or create something else or add a feature later. And you'll be saying it's about time. Wish they'd done that six years ago, but it got done. All right. So with that said, um, moving on. Uh, libraries now with groups and here's one of my favorite I, I have this this passage up for a reason this is a multi-page InDesign document and in this particular um, InDesign document I've got this this text frame or this frame with text in it and I want to talk about one of the reasons why or one of the ways you can avoid having a panel up all the time. So for example, before this feature got introduced, I would pretty much have the glyphs panel um, as part of my workflow. So I would have this panel up at all times or at least readily accessible so that I could go to a particular character and see of a particular font and see what other available glyphs there were for that character. Now, because of a feature that should have been there a long time ago, uh, I can close this panel because I don't need it open. In, uh, I don't need it open every time, all the time, because that feature is now built into the canvas. So, for example, if I want a fancier, um, a fancier E on the end of this, I'm going to highlight the E. And now when I hover below, just to the bottom right of it, I get those extra glyphs. So I don't need the panel to show me the alternates for that character. I can just click and get the alternate for that character. Now, you're if you're scrambling to find, hey, that's cool. Let me try it on this font. Not all fonts have alternates. As a matter of fact, most fonts don't have alternates or not a lot of alternates anyway. Where you will find the most alternates, and this is just a bonus tip, 
is you will find um, alternates on mostly script script fonts. So fonts that are scripts because they they're the designer kind of had fun with the alternate glyphs that were available. So for example, if I wanted a better F to begin this to begin this with, I don't have a ton of great choices. <laughs> I can have that one or this one. So again, it is based on the design of the font. Uh, if I wanted a better P for this, uh, oh, there are some better P's. That one might be a little crazy. Yeah, that's a little crazy. Let's undo that. Uh, that one's a little cooler though. So this way, especially for people that are designing logos or designing specific type um, uh, attributes for a layout, you can have something custom that someone else wouldn't that someone else wouldn't have because they just type even in the same font just what was on the keyboard. So I love having alternate glyphs and I love it even more that I can now do it on the canvas and I don't need the glyphs panel open anymore. All right, this is another kind of tidy up kind of thing. I have a couple of these. So first and foremost, uh, let's bring up the swatches panel because I want to show you swatches for a minute. And all right, I am, where am I, where is, where's my swatches? There they are. All right, bring up my swatches. All right, so we make swatches so that we don't have to mix colors every single time, mix the same color every single time. And that's great. And that way, when you hand the document off, the, the person picking that document up would have all the colors necessary to make that document work. They would have all the colors you used. But what if you made swatches and you ended up not using them, or you ended up, um, uh, Anne-Marie, hang on, I'll answer that in a second. You end up um, using the swatch, but then switching it to switching something to a different color, and then that swatch becomes unused, basically. So I have some swatches in here that aren't being used. So how would I delete them or get rid of them? I don't know which ones I've not used or which ones I've used. So if you uh, pop out the flyout menu, there is an option to select all unused. This is brilliant. I love this because it says, I'm going to go through your document. I'm going to find all the swatches you didn't use. Select them for you, which I added those on purpose and didn't use them. And then that way you can just go ahead and delete them. And even though it says delete swatch, it really means delete all that are selected. So that way, boom, I got rid of all the ones that I didn't use. So now these are all in use. These are the colors that make up this document. Same thing applies for your, um, your paragraph styles. So for example, If, uh, and see, yeah, I need to do it from the menu because I, that, even though that's in the properties panel, I still need to be able to access the flyout menu. So we want, oh, we want styles, paragraph styles. So same thing. We have all these paragraph styles. Well, did I use all of them? Do I need all of them? I'm done with the document. Uh, I kind of want to keep it clean. Do I need all this excess stuff that I didn't use? Probably not. So same concept. Um, select un all unused, which there are three. And then I could just simply delete them if I if I know that I'm not gonna need them. Now this one has a table of contents one. So if I haven't generated the table of contents yet, I probably wanna keep that one. <laughs> but magazine title didn't get used. So do I really need magazine title? If not, then I can go ahead and delete it. All right, so, uh, and I imagine the same thing is for character styles. I haven't tested it in this document yet, but let's see, select all unused. Yep, there are two character styles that didn't get used. So do I need them or am I going to use them? Up to you. All right. And this one is, is this is, I, I saved this one for last because this is my biggest pet peeve in terms of, uh, in terms of working with documents, especially that you get from someone else. I'll never forget the first document I got from a colleague. This was even before this was, this was before Adobe. So, but it was in a similar situation. I opened it up. I was like, oh, that looks good. Yeah, I like it. Oh, but this one little thing should be moved over here. So I, I grabbed my selection tool. 
I went to go click on that one little thing and it clicked on like this, this frame came up that had nothing to do with the thing I was trying to click on. It was for some object that was way on the other side of the page. And what that meant was, and it's probably easier to show it with a graphic. What that meant was the person had made a frame that was like that, you know, that was just kind of obnoxiously bigger than it needed to be. So if you can imagine them doing that for every single thing on the page, it was a nightmare trying to find the actual frame for the object that I was trying to click on. So because every frame was bigger than it needed to be. So I refer to this and I've referred to this for, for years as just have good document hygiene. Don't make handles for things that are that are off the page that don't need to be. Don't make things bigger than they need to be. Don't make things that are just, you know, all over the top because someone's going to try and click on something, probably you, and you're not going to be able to find it because you got all these frames all over the place. So one of the ways to do that, um, of course, you can go to your properties panel and there's a fitting option that is fit frame to content. And that will say, you know what, I'm just going to suck the frame down to be no bigger than it needs to be. And I believe that will work. I believe there's an option to do that with text, if I remember correctly. And it may be me just not seeing it here in the new properties panel. But there should be a fit. No, that's not it. It should be a fit option for that as well. Let me just see here real quick. All right, fitting, fitting, fitting. There we go. Fit frame to content. There it is. All right, I found it the hard way, but yeah, it's probably over here as a button. I'm just not seeing it. So that's what you really want. You don't want frames to be any bigger than they need to be because then they're not going to be in the way. But let's say something was in the way. Let's say that this image, and let's bring it to the front. Um, oh, and it may not bring it to the front because it may depend on what layer it's on. Let's see what layer that's on. Now, I don't know why that would be on the text layer, but that's wrong. That should be on the text layer. But anyway, I didn't make the document. Don't blame me. All right, but I'm going to bring it to the front. All right, so now that image is on the front of that text. We know the text is below it. It's just in the stacking order, that particular one. So if you want to um, get to something that you know is there without moving the object out of the way, uh, this is an old trick, but if you hold down on the Mac your command key or PC your control key and keep clicking, if I can do this properly, oh, maybe I can't. Well, it used to, let me click through. There it is. Okay, I did it there. Oh, I wasn't clicking in the right spot. There we go. There it is. All right, so um, command or con PC control it will let you cycle through all the objects that are buried underneath something. So that way I could now arrow it out or if I could click it, you know, without selecting the image again, then I could get it out of the way. So if for whatever reason you don't want to move a stack of things and you just want to get to something underneath it and maybe make it bigger or do something like that, like that, you can. So that was a command shift greater than just to make it bigger. And for whatever reason, if you wanted to make it bigger, you could. Um, but the best way to arrange things in stacking order is use your layers panel because then that way you won't have to worry about it. And by the way, I said that this should be on the graphics layer and it should be. I'm not sure why the person who did this document put it in the text layer. It's probably an accident. But you can move it by moving this little dot that represents that image down to the layer that you want it to be in. So now I put it in the graphics layer. So if I turn off the graphics layer, it goes, oh, none of these are in there. Oh, this is lame. This person did not, they put them where, on the background? Yeah, these are in the background. Maybe they should be on the background. Okay. But anyway, this should be on the text layer. This should be on the graphics layer. And now it is. So that way, if I control the graphics layer, like locking it, I'm not going to accidentally move it or change it around. Uh, this should be on the text layer. It is. So, for example, if I lock the text layer but unlock the graphics layer, then I can move the graphic around without messing up my text. 
So that's why we work in layers. That's how we keep things organized. That's how we drill down if we need to. All right, um, looks like we are done. So with that said, thanks for watching and we will catch you on the next one. Bye everybody.